Good. So now we're on uh, notes number 10, and we're starting at page 94 because we've uh, just finished uh, the um, uh, development of, of the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle for seismograms and also considered how we might define that principle differently, although we'll you know, essentially get the same result. Uh, you'll see that. Uh, no, you won't see that's in lab four. Um, so you won't see that in, in uh, the uh, labs you're doing this year. Um, so the next uh, uh, topic is the resolution versus variance trade-off. And you may remember at the uh, beginning of this section, uh, I said I would cover uncertainty principles and resolution versus variance, where uh, you know, we have uh, some data um, series, and we say, all right, uh, we can determine a, uh, uh, an average in time of this, of this series. Okay, And so we know, maybe we know decently well, but with some error, some delta m, uh, some error, what, what that value is. But then uh, we don't really know where that value is. It's somewhere in there, right? Um, and that's uh, the uncertainty in the time of it is delta tau, or if you want, lambda tau. So that uh, is going to be another uh, trade-off or an uncertainty function, uh, uncertainty principle, much like the uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle between bandwidth and time time span. Okay. So first of all, we got to define what we mean by um, resolution and variance. And uh, you know the variance of what? Well, it's the variance of the mean. Okay. And the mean of what? Okay. So um, it would be uh, useful if we had a concept of what is the mean uh, mean value of a uh, random series or even a deterministic series um, if if we take an instantaneous sample? Now this may seem a little weird uh, because that's what we're doing all the time uh, with our uh, with our digitizers. You know we have we have some kind of uh, of sample that that. At least we've considered up to this point was taken at one instant in time. You know, one the the amount of time to uh, to digitize the the ten thousand and thirty second um, sample in our in our seismogram. You know, we consider to be zero. But if you think about how the electronics would have to work to to do that, you realize, oh, you know, the time to get that sample is hopefully less than than the delta t we set, uh, but it may not be much less. You know, we got in fact we got no guarantees that it's that it's uh, uh, anything but uh, delta t itself. So there's a uncertainty in time, delta t, uh, which is our our sample interval. You know, even on a simple sampled seismogram, and that should lead you know to a uh, the possibility of having some variance. You know, if we had if we had averaged over uh, half delta t instead of delta t, uh, or taken the sample and, and electronically uh, sampled, um, you know, and of course half of a uh, an analog to digital converter is on the analog side. If we had if we had taken that sample electronically uh, over a different span of time, you know, what what could be the variance in that? Okay, and there is some variance. Um, uh, it's just uh, we don't just we just don't usually think about it, but when we're dealing with noise and what to do with noise, we've got to think about it. All right, so we need a concept. Uh, all right, we we have data that are sampled at some finite uh, time span. Okay, you know, say over that delta t, we need a concept of an instantaneous mean. All right. And and the um, and we all we already uh, should recognize that the instantaneous mean 
is not going to be perfectly accurate. Okay, if if we're talking about a stochastic process, you know, by by which I mean a random process, not a deterministic process, um, and then we know also from just from quantum mechanics that even if we could, you know, perfectly sample a, a uh, 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 an analog physical process, just because of of uh, either the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or because of quantum mechanics, we are um, we are not going to get a perfect measurement. Okay, so uh, all right, uh, for our stochastic processes, we have this concept of the ensemble, and we can take a, a mean uh, at at some exact time t. Okay, we'll take that mean m at the exact time t, and that, of course, is the ensemble average, which is called the expectation, expectation of x at t. Uh, there is also a um, a variance sigma squared that is uh, the the power after subtracting the expected mean over the ensemble. Okay, so. Um, uh, and, and maybe this makes sense only for stochastic processes, but it occurs otherwise as well. So the uh, the variance sigma squared, which which of course the variance is time dependent, right? So we got to talk about sigma the variance sigma squared at time t is equal to the expectation of not of the value x, the expectation of the value x minus the Mean m sub t, okay, squared. You know what is the expectation of that difference squared? Okay, and that's that's a different thing than, uh, and, and this is not zero. Okay, the expectation of, of x is different from the expectation of uh, of x minus m. Okay, now that'll become clear. That may, maybe is not so clear when the expectation is the ensemble average and it's instantaneous. But of course, that's only theoretical. So, if we make the expectation a time average, then you know it'll become more. You know, you'll you'll be able to grasp what that means. And um, you know, just to be clear, sigma itself, you know, not sigma squared. Uh, we know that we call it the standard deviation. Okay, so that's exactly what uh, what sigma is. All right, so. Um, we recall that the expectation operator acts as a summation over the ensemble. Expectation of some x is the limit as uh, the the ensemble number of traces in the ensemble goes to zero. Excuse me, goes to infinity of one over n. Okay, of the sum from you know i equals one to n of all the possible values of x sub i. Um, you know, all, uh, and i is the index at, at that uh, at that ensemble. I, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, at, uh, I is the index to the trace in the ensemble. Now, this could all be done at uh, uh, at one time. So, you know, I'm not using i instead of t here. Okay, I'm really, you know, this is really averaging over that ensemble of quintillions of uh, different traces, quintillions of different alternative u universes. Okay? And it could be the expectation, you know, it's, it's just whatever x it is. Okay? All right, so, so this way, um, sigma squared is the expectation of x, t, uh, x at t squared, all right, minus 2m at t times the expectation of x at t Plus m at t squared, okay, and the expectation. The, excuse me, the uh, 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 the variance uh, sigma squared at t is equal to the expectation of x squared at t minus m squared at t. Okay, so um, uh, you know that's that's theoretical. You know, right? How you know the, here we're not we're not. Concluding whether we can actually get the ensemble or not, maybe in rare cases we can, uh, and in other cases we're going to use a time average and assume that we have ergodic uh, time series, stationary series, or stationary random processes. Um, and we often think, well, 
you know, the M, if we have mixed processes, mixed um, uh, stochastic and, and deterministic, okay, then M is what the deterministic process gives us. Okay, and uh, and X would be would be M plus the the stochastic, the stochastic process. Another way to look at it. The true or expected mean, uh, you know. So here's a new way of thinking about it. You can compute that that M, okay, uh, from the probability density function, and we'll call that P of X, okay. Uh, so it's the probability that we'll get a particular value of x. So for um, um, for rolling a, a, a single die, the probability of getting zero is zero. The probability of getting one is one sixth. The probability of getting four is one sixth, and so forth. Probability of getting ten is zero. Okay. So it's a function like that, and and. Uh, it's a function of the you know the amplitude of the time series, if you like, you know it's the value in that in that series. Um, it's not a, uh, I mean, probability functions, of course, in real data do do vary in time, but you know we'll we'll all too quickly latch onto our assumption of stationarity and say, okay, the you know like with like rolling a die. You know, I'm not going to change the rules, and, and at some time I'm going to start rolling two dice. You know, I'm 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 going to have a stable uh, probability density function. So p we'll think of as not changing with time, uh, but just as a different value at each possible amplitude, right? The probability that you know it's a it's a it's a little comb function, right? Because the probability of of rolling a single die and and getting uh, 2.5 is also zero. Okay. The probability of rolling a single die and getting 2.99 is zero. So, you know, it's it it depends entirely on how the, um, you know, how it's determined. Of course, if you you know, you'd have to give a finite, although near zero, probability for the uh, the die landing on a corner, and then you'd have to have some some, uh, you know, some way of deciding what its value would be. <laughs> um, Maybe you let the die land on a corner, but then you have to wait for the next earthquake to let it settle. Okay, that's probably what I would do. Uh, trouble is, uh, in our data and the stochastic part of our data set, you know, we we don't often know p, but if we did, okay, uh, and and here's where you know you get into the realm of stochastic modeling, you know. We're we're forever trying to create a stochastic model, which, you know, at its base it involves rolling a bunch of dice, okay, in the computer, of course, with you know using whatever random number generator we have, which are never perfectly random, but uh, you know we if we use good ones we can get kind of close. Um, so uh, um, the uh, uh, you know we can we can make a model. All right, of a random process, and we, you know, the the probability function p of x, that's the model really, you know, okay, and it, it, it can be quite complicated, um, and so we set that up as a model, and then we say, all right, um, you know, given that we integrate uh, x times p of x dx, you know, for some value x, and that gives us the expectation of x. Okay, and uh, um, uh, and that's going to be and and that we've already defined as being equal to the the mean m. So um, uh, you know this is uh, uh, this is how we try to understand these things, uh, constructing models, uh, stochastic models. Um, I mean, some of your calculators and and you know, I'm sure uh, Python and and uh, Java they all have Rand um, functions in them. Um, I really uh, I'm a big fan of a function I learned from a HP calculator book uh, back in the Stone Age uh, before you were born, um, where uh, you take some uh, number between zero and one, okay, uh, that has like ten digits. And you multiply it by 997, and you um, you cut off uh, um, 
uh, you cut off the integer part. And so the fractional part that's left is another you know, very long number between, uh, uh, between uh, 0 and 1. And so that's your new random number. Um, and uh, you can control the precision of that very simple um, uh, random number generator uh, in, a, in a very simple way. Um, if you um, if you use a uh, um, uh, a four byte floating point number for that fractional part, I mean that's only got six digits of precision. Okay, and after um, it'll repeat after I don't know just tens of thousands. You know, you generate ten thousand random numbers, and and it'll come it'll cycle back around. And, and start giving you exactly the same sequence of random numbers again. Okay, that's only after ten thousand. Um, and if you use a uh, uh, an eight byte double precision floating point number, uh, at least double precision as as uh, computers used to be, um, then it'll take two billion to uh, to come around again. So uh, you know you got some control over the uh, uh, over the the. The the, uh, uh, the the precision you want, okay. The the time you have before before the whole ra pseudo random sequence repeats. That's the big failure of random number generators. And I, I you know I have to be convinced that uh, uh, any given random number generator. I know the one in Java is uh, is lame and doesn't you know has a much uh, shorter repeatability than um, than this uh, double precision uh, you know two billion. Uh, random number generator, so that's uh, that's a problem, um, and uh, you know I'd have to I'd have to do an experiment to be convinced, say that the Python one is any better. Uh, so I, I I prefer to know because because these uh, probability functions and uh, and stochastic models are important to me, you know I, I want to use my own random number generator because I understand it. Um, so. Um, it's important to test your random number generator because of this. Okay, so um, with this probability function concept, another thing we can do is define the st statistical independence of two random series x and y. So x and y are purely random series, no deterministic component. Okay, and and in fact, if they had the same deterministic component, then they should have no statistical independence, right? They should, you know, they should be pretty strongly correlated, right? So, uh, uh, you know, this is a this is also a test to determine um, whether your your series are not only independent but they're they're each random, okay? Because you won't get as much statistical independence if um, uh, if they've got uh, deterministic components. So that's uh, uh, the statistical independence is um, um, is uh, p of x versus y, and that's equal to um, you know it, that's equal to the value you know the value like the one six right for a die uh, of x versus the value uh, uh, the p at the val for the value of y, you know so uh, you know x could be one, for a die, x could be one, y could be two, and both of these would be one six. So it'd be one. You know the uh, uh, the way to get uh, um, uh, you know, have one thirty six chance of getting uh, uh, of getting a random series each generated by one die. Uh, two of those random series uh, would have a one in thirty six chance of being one and two. So, um, so with this definition, then okay, then uh, you can reduce the uh, uh, you can get an idea. You know how do certain operators flow through the the expectation? Okay, now since the expectation is an ensemble average, it uh, you know an average is done by adding things up, right? So, um, uh, so you add two two series. And the and and the expectation comes through. You know the expectation is a linear operator with re, with respect to adding. Is is expectation a linear operator with respect to multiplication? Uh, 
Okay, so the expectation of x times y is the expectation of x times the expectation of y. And that you can derive from, from this statement here and the definition of the expectation in terms of the, uh, of the probability function. So that's a little background on, on probability functions there. Okay. Um, that that's going to help us as as and help you as as you work through uh, the uh, um, you know how to how to how to look at, at these functions uh, underneath the expectation. Um, you know it's easy to add things up uh, after you've gotten the expectation, but but you know what do you do if you have you know sums and squares before the expectation? So we have a time series x sub t. Whose values are independently chosen. Okay, so for instance, um, uh, you can imagine if I'm if I'm uh, um, what this means is that at any particular time, you know, I do a fair and independent roll of the dice. All right, so the the value I get for for x at t plus one has nothing to do with the value I get for x at t. And we'll talk more about this uh, this this property of you know non correlation with itself. This property of, of being independently chosen. All right. So for two times t and s, with time t not being equal to time s, okay, um, the expectation of x times of of x at t times x at s is going to be the expectation of x at t times the expectation of of x at time s. Okay, so that's that seems like an obvious result, and and but again, there's a there's a kind of a hidden test here that the um, you know this only works. This is only true if if the time series x has values that are independently chosen at different times, which means that they are uncorrelated in time. If the uh, uh, if the value at uh, t plus one was always, you know, the value at t plus plus two, okay, then you know it'd be a per it'd be a perfectly correlated time series, okay, which which it would be a divergent time series too. But um, you know, if if it was if the value at at uh, t plus one was uh, the value at t plus the uh, uh, the sine of t, you know, that would be very, very well correlated, and and this this expectation um, relationship then would not hold. Okay, so now we will uh, we will also assume then that um, the uh, you know this holds for any uncorrelated series. Now we're going to let the the random series we're going to let the series be perfectly random. Okay, so x is perfectly random, and it's going to be. In, in addition, it's going to be ergodic, uh, or in other words, stationary. You know, so we're not changing the rules on how we we generate the random series. Okay, those those aren't changing with time. Okay, and so what this is going to show is that the uh, that given the def definition of m at t and the definition of sigma at t. For ergodic or stationary series, both of those are constant with time. So the whole time series really just has one value of m and one value of sigma. Okay. Okay. So for this, you know, now very limited class ergodic signal. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not changing the number of dice I'm rolling uh, as I'm generating it. The uh, the expected ensemble average would be identical to the time average, um, and and uh, um, and and the time average we'll call m hat, right? So we got the real with the real ensemble average m m, and if we do a time average approximation of that ensemble average, we'll call that m hat, m hat, right? Because uh, you know, hat usually means an approximation, and the idea is okay. How close are we, right? So the uh, uh, you know, 
the time if you take the time average over any one signal from that ensemble, okay, then uh, m at t, um, which is which is constant, is equal to m hat at t, which is also constant. Well, which may or may not be constant, okay, which is equal to one over n uh, times the sum of uh, 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 t uh, uh, the sum from uh, t equals one to n of that signal from the ensemble, you know, x at t, which you know, one signal from the ensemble that could be our our, our data series, our time series. Okay, so x at t is our time series, uh, and and I hedged on you know is m hat constant? Well, maybe not. If if n is too small, okay. If we had a data, have a data series that's a thousand points long, right, and that's it, then then of course, you know, and we take big N equal to a thousand, then it's not going to vary over time. But if we take big N equal to two or three, yeah, it is going to vary, as you might expect. Okay, so you know, there's now the problem that we we have to have a big enough N, and and then the question, how close are we with given some N? And then there's the issue that, you know, uh, actually, oh, oh yeah, but we never have ergodic signals. Okay, our our random processes are never are never stochastic, are never uh, perfectly stationary, so we could be looking at uh, you know wind noise on our seismic record, or um, uh, or the noise of the streamer being pulled through the the ocean, okay, and the waves slapping the surface above. Um, and uh, you know, one minute the uh, uh, the wind will be high, and the next minute it could die, and and the whole you know all this uh, uh, random appearing noise could change its character entirely. Okay, and uh, uh, you know even when it looks pretty ergodic, uh, you know we know that it's got to be changing. Okay, so we got to evaluate, we got to establish how far. You know how far is this time average estimate m hat? How far is that away from the true uh, ensemble average m? And of course, it depends on that averaging length, big n. Okay. So okay, this is our the the you know here's our here's here's the the time average that 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 we can evaluate. We can actually you know put our data through. A time average, and we can come up with an m hat, and and this m here, that's theoretical. We have no idea what that is. Okay, that's the that's the ensemble average, and we don't have anything like the ensemble. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna assume that you know there's gonna be some delta m, right? And that is our the uncertainty in m, right? Delta m is the uncertainty in m, which is the the value we get minus the true value, whatever the heck that is, okay, if we could get it, all right, and um, and delta m squared, that's our that's our variance, okay, um, is the is thus the expectation of m hat minus m quantity squared, the expectation of all that, including the the squaring and you know inside the expectation. All right, so let's just plug. You know, we're using a time average anyway. Okay, we're assuming stationarity. Okay, uh, and we've got some. You know, we're going to establish some number of samples in. Okay, um, so we can. You know, we can plug in even for the. You know, we're. You know, for this theoretical m, not m hat, but for the theoretical m, we're we're willing to plug in a time average. Okay. So uh, delta m squared is equal to the expectation of all this, one over big N squared, and then the time average sum of x at t minus m, and the time average sum of x at s minus m. Okay, right? Because we're right, we're getting two different time averages here at different times, but they should be constant. All right, so let's play them off against each other. That's what's really going on here. All right. So uh, of course, the expectation itself has a summation nature. All right. So it commutes with the sums. OK. 
Okay. So, so we pull outside 1 over n squared. We got the sum over t, the sum over s, okay, and the expectation of, um, of x at t minus, minus m and, and times the quantity x at s minus m. Okay. And we've already said, you know, these are, this is a, the values in x, right? We just got one time series x, right? And we look at two different times at, at time t and time s. Okay, it's it's it should be independent, right? It should be independent. Um, so if we're looking at the same, if we're looking at diff, different times, okay, if t is not equal to s, then the expectation of this of the this is really a correlation, right? At 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 some non-zero lag, okay. That expectation should be zero because we have uncorrelated data. Okay, then if t equals s, that expectation is just boils down to the expectation of x at t minus m squared, which we've already decided we predefined as as sigma squared at t, the variance. Well, isn't this convenient? You know, we made enough definitions. That included enough of the stuff that's purely theoretical. We could never evaluate. That we could knock them out. You know, we could the stuff that we can't evaluate. We, uh, uh, you know, we can get rid of. Wasn't that convenient? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of assumptions in here. Okay, and uh, you know, there's a lot of summation going on here. Um, and there's a lot of reliance on on uh, you know kind of stable statistical properties, the stationarity, uh, um, and and the known um, the known uh, and and evaluatable um, probability function, right? All that you know is 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 all assumption in here. Okay. So okay, we can get that far. Now now uh, uh, recall from you know your your uh, work with uh, in math with um, um, with matrices, for instance, uh, the Kronecker delta, you know, or with uh, stresses, okay, and and uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, you know, these uh, two dimensional uh, objects, okay. Um, they're not vectors. They're uh, sorry. Okay, so the Kronecker delta. Is uh, a simple function. Uh, if t is not equal to s, then it gives zero. If uh, if t is equal to s, it gives one. So for you know self uncorrelated x of t, okay, then uh, delta m squared is equal to you know the uncertainty, uh, the variance is one over n squared times the uh, uh, the you know we sum over all t and all s. Uh, sigma t squared times the Kronecker delta, you know, which only yields uh, uh, anything but zero if t is equal to s. Okay, and and so that boils down to uh, delta m squared is equal to one over n squared times uh, uh, the. Uh, it's like this is like the time average now of sigma squared, right? And so what we're really getting is. You know we're getting sigma squared n times, and I should have put the limits on here just to make that clear uh, on the on the summation there. Uh, but so we've got we've got n over n squared times sigma squared, so it's one over n times sigma squared uh, uh, t. Okay, and so we take the square root of both sides, and what do we have to acknowledge? Okay, delta m. Okay, our our uncertainty. Is plus or minus right because you know we have one over uh, uh, square root of m. I'm sorry, one over square root of n, right? Or, or and and uh, we've taken the square root of sigma squared. So you know sigma itself could be positive, could be negative. All right. So just formally we have to say all right, could be positive, could be negative, right? And in fact, it could flip from positive to negative, and and this equation is still true. So we gotta we gotta preserve that plus or minus there, okay, through the square root. 
Um, okay, so so uh, delta m could be plus or minus one over the square root of n times sigma. That then is the accuracy of the time average of length n. Okay, so so if you have um, uh, if you have one sample, then your uncertainty is the variant is is the uh, uh, your uncertainty is the standard deviation, okay, and it, and it's also related to you can relate it back to the uh, um, you can relate that back to the uh, the probability function, okay, um, and if you take a longer time average, if you make big n a million, right, um, then uh, um, then, you know, then you get a much smaller, uh, you know, you get a thousandth as much um, uh, as much variance. Okay. Again, this is a stochastic process, right? Any variance due to deterministic process, we assume there's no deterministic deterministic process in here, and and thus no, you know, the variance due to the deterministic process is zero. Uh, we're assuming that everything is purely stochastic here, and purely stationary as well. Okay, um, but this is this is a, an incredibly useful concept. Okay, um, you know, with larger averaging length, the more samples we include, okay, the the variance we'll experience is smaller, and our thus our estimate of the true mean m is better. Okay, uh, and, um, uh, and and if you just you know take uh, n random numbers having mean zero, right? So random numbers that are in a seismogram and various unity, okay, then they'll add up to plus or minus n to the um, the power of minus one half, you know, one over the square root of n. Okay, plus or minus that. Uh, so this is a, a very useful concept. Notice that there's, you know, that square root of n here brings about a huge diminishing return. Okay, so going from one sample to ten is, you know, one third the variance. Going from from uh, uh, going for, going to twenty samples, right? What's the square root of twenty? Uh, uh, must be uh, uh, four and something, right? It's not five. So uh, you know, you take twice as many samples, and you and you go from one third the variance to one quarter the variance. I mean, you gain hardly anything for twice as much work. Okay. So you know, now time recording that that may be poorly correlated with your cost, and so you know you can push the amount of time you record. But if you're if you're trying to reduce your variance by by planting more seismometers or or hitting the, the sledgehammer more times, you know then then you're really working for every single every single sample, okay? And you know this is this applies to spatial series just as well as it does to time series. And, and um, so so uh, you know if you're if if uh, if your back's going to go out on the on the twenty on the twenty fifth uh, swing, then uh, you know you really uh, um, you know that's that's why um, that's why in in my experience you know I never go for for twenty swings, okay, of the of the sledgehammer, because it's only taking us from one third the variance of one swing to to you know uh, one one quarter the variance of of one swing. And it's twice as hard, you know. You get twice as many injuries. Well, actually, actually, the potential for injury, right, um, goes up uh, pretty much as the square of the number of swings. So, so the potential of injury is far higher, okay, for almost no benefit. So, uh, you know, ten swings per uh, per hammer point is probably the sweet spot, at least for my classes, okay. Um, you know, if you get a very experienced crew. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, that's uh, you know accustomed to it, 
then uh, you know they can double the number of swings without um, without having three times the number of injuries. Okay, and uh, and so that you know it may be it you know you could make the calculation it may be worth it. Um, you know, and, and certainly planning more seismometers, right? Uh, um, you know, you um, you know what if we what if we double the the number of stations in our network, okay? Um, to uh, uh, you know, from one hundred to uh, uh, well, let's say we uh, uh, yeah, let's say we doubled it from one hundred to two hundred, right? Then uh, you know that would take. Uh, we'd need uh, twice as many technicians, okay, and twice as much money from the USGS and and from from NNSA, and um, but we'd only have uh, you know thirty percent thirty thirty percent better results, you know, and the cost benefit becomes you know kind of diminishing. Um, some places in California and, and in dense urban areas, you know, you can make the argument, yeah, yeah, we should put a hundred stations over this small area, because it's it's not only going to be giving us, you know, uh, lower variance, okay, it's got other benefits too, you know, higher resolution, for instance, and uh, but but this this square root. Uh, this is this is going to because all data are noisy, um, and sub and all data are subject to the number of samples. You know this is this is what'll kill you if you if you let it get out of hand. Okay, if you if you fight this, you can't fight this square root. Okay, and if you try, you're going to lose. All right, uh, you got to do the analysis and find that economic. Or, you know, safety sweet spot. You know, what should end be before you you get diminishing returns? What's your effective end? Okay, it might be many fewer than you think. Okay, depending on the cost of what you're doing. Uh, okay, enough enough on my soapbox there. Uh, let's get to the trade-off. Um, Okay, so we have delta m squared is one over n times sigma squared. All right, that was uh, that we established uh, up here, right there. Okay, so um, uh, delta m squared times n is equal to sigma squared, and sigma squared is some constant, right? It's never never zero. We got a stochastic process here. It's got it's got a standard deviation. Okay, if it if it had zero standard deviation, it would not be a stochastic process. Okay, and then and then what is delta t? How do we bring delta t in here? You know the the length over which we we average. Well, delta t is equal to n times. I'm sorry, delta tau is the length over which we're averaging, and that of course is n times the the length of a of a single time sample, right? N times delta t. So delta m uh, squared. Times delta t is equal to a constant, which you can see is uh, um, is going to be uh, uh, sigma squared times uh, n. Wait, no, sigma squared divided by n. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's what it is. Um, so uh, uh, um, you know, delta m squared is is just to restate is the um, uh, the estimate of the mean, okay, the uh, 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 the the variance in the estimate of the mean, and delta tau is the length of the sample, okay, and that is always um, that is always greater than or equal to a constant. Now, one corollary to what we've just done is this little equation over here on the right, okay. It's kind of an approximation, all right. Delta, uh, I'm sorry, sigma hat squared at uh, at t is about equal to a pretty good approximation. It's it's the true sigma squared, right? Not only, I mean, there's a true sigma, right? And there's the true sigma. But how do we know sigma, right? That's another one of those one of those things that comes from an ensemble average. We don't know what that is. No idea. Okay. 
what we what we can measure is a time average of sigma, right? The standard deviation of our of our time average. Okay, well that's an estimate to sigma, so that's sigma hat squared, and that's going to be equal to, um, you know, we just don't just didn't work out the math here, but you'll you'll see this if you work it out. It's about sigma squared, okay, that true sigma squared plus something more. It could be minus something more, but but it's it's uh, it could also be plus something something more. So it's got an uncertainty now. We're adding uncertainty to our to our estimate of, of sigma, right? This is the 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 standard deviation, the standard deviation, right? Which uh, uh, you know, what good is that, right? Well, we are you know what we're what we're going to assess is that our sigma squared is you know we're gonna we're gonna get an estimate of it, and it's it's probably going to be greater than the true sigma, okay? Because uh, you know we might be adding, uh, you know. So here's uh, the true, an unevaluable, uh, you know, unattainable sigma squared. Here's sigma squared, but divided by uh, uh, square root of n. Again, you know, just evaluating that that um, that you know, just in the process of trying to evaluate the uh, the standard deviation, you know, we got to go through these gyrations that depend on. Um, on the number of samples we have, because that's all we can do is a time average, okay? And, and you know that's even under the assumptions of stationarity and everything, okay? Because we just can't do that ensemble average, don't have it. Um, so, uh, 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 sigma squared uh, over uh, uh, square root of n, you know, is is how we're gonna. You know, we're going to be uh, if we have too few samples. You know, we might have our our estimated variance could be as bad as two times sigma squared. Okay, so um, so here's a here's that uncertainty principle, and, and there's that that trade off. Which uh, again, you know, to get that we've we've made a bunch of assumptions, and let me assure you, if you don't make those assumptions, it's worse. Okay, this is the way to get it to be. As 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 nice of a trade off as possible, um, and uh, and if you don't make the stationary assumption or whatever, then then you know both of the you know the constant is far larger. Okay, so so uh, you know evaluating the time uncertainty of a particular uh, of, of a particular um, uh, variance. Okay. It's going to come out the best under all the assumptions, and we violate that stationarity assumption or any of the others, and you know it's it, it's going to come out worse. Okay. Morals of the story here: If you've got a finite net number of samples, um, and don't we always have a finite number of samples, right? Even if we got a month-long size of RAM, that's still only two billion samples. So you know it's it's only so good. Got a finite number of samples because we don't know you know we don't have uh, we don't have that omniscient view that uh, gives us you know the whole world from uh, negative infinity in time to positive infinity in time. Um, you know the finite number of samples increases our variance, okay, and, and it increases the variance we're going to get when we assess it by, via a time average. If we want to more accurately estimate the variance, you know, which can, which of course is going to be variable, we need more samples of time. So any time variance relation has an imprecise location in time. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, you know we might we might look over our you know we might look over our seismogram and say, all right, I'm going to wait till the variance settles down, you know, uh, but then where do I make the cut? Well, has it you know, I, I need to. I need to. I, I can only see the differences in the variance if I'm using, you know, an hour-long averaging window. And oh, as it settled down here, well, you know, what do I use to cut out that variance? Is it the beginning of the averaging window or the end? Or, you know, and and actually, one of the morals here is that it doesn't actually matter because we just don't know. Okay, you just have to accept that increased variance, that increased uncertainty 
in the in the time location. Okay, and don't get caught by that square root. <laughs> don't get don't beat your head against the wall of diminishing returns. <laughs>